Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Yeah, it's good to be back. We have a, a bonus presentation today. Really? <laughs> no, this wasn't on the original schedule, right? We have new speakers yeah, today. Exactly, exactly. We were really happy when uh, those guys that are going to present today were accepted to be here. So first of all, I'm Felipe Matias. I'm talking from North Dakota State University. I'm Claire Gehagen. I am talking from Agriculture Canada in Ottawa. Awesome. And we are from Force. Let's start with our presentation, Claire. So for the ones that already saw our workshops, we always start with a tradition presentation and keep an eye on that and we'll be starting the workshop soon. Yeah. So we are Phenome Force, so we're uh, a network that is working to connect people and especially early empower early career researchers in phenomics and build an online library of resources and provide training. And our main group members are Anna Rita, myself, Felipe, and Nora Falgren. So if we go to the next slide. If you want to follow us, we have our website, which has a list of all the past presentations, as well as upcoming workshops and some more information on it, as well as Twitter and the YouTube channel. Hopefully, if you're watching this video, you found our YouTube channel. It also has all of our past videos on it. And we have an email address and a Slack channel. If you're interested in getting involved in our Slack channel, just send us an email and we'll add you in. Um, and if we go to the Slack channel, we have a, a few different discussions there. So there are suggestions, if you have suggestions for presentations or the styles of workshops we're holding, any job offers, if you have a position you want to share, that's a good tab to keep an eye on, as well as just some general information on the introduction and information about our Friday hands-on workshops. And our YouTube channel is um, right here and we have all of our videos so when we're live that live video will be posted to the channel the next day so it'll be available if you want to come back and follow slower and pause and play those are all available there and make sure you subscribe so that you get notifications when we have our next workshop session coming up I guess I guess I'm, I was mute <laughs> <laughs> So first of all, thank you uh, guys for being here. Uh, don't forget to subscribe in our YouTube channel. Uh, every time when you go live, you're going to receive a message and then you can keep following our work. We already have many workshops there. So have your time, go there, uh, see what you like and share these in your social media. Don't forget to give our like because that helps us to put this information out there. Okay. Uh, this uh, year, our workshop series is talking about setting up low-cost phenotyping platforms, and we start last April 9th, and today is our 10th workshop and the last workshop of this season, unfortunately, <laughs> but uh, we're going to plan our next season, and so if you have an idea for what we can present, please contact us, send a message, and use any one of the social media that Claire just talked about, and... Uh, Let's work together on this. Today, uh, as I said, it, was, it is our last workshop, and I'm really happy to have two colleagues from North Dakota presenting today. And I'm going to introduce them in a bit. Uh, the, workshop to, uh, the workshop and the hands-on part, uh, it is in the GitHub. The, this link is right here in the description, but we also send more information if you sign up for if you register did the registration for this workshop series and uh the speaker is going to talk mainly about your softwares kgis and r yeah with these i wanted to introduce my two colleagues uh, uh diego gris and paulo flores they are from north dakota state university and they're going to talk about the basis of drone flights and that destruction for small plots research is it, it is our uh first uh drone related workshop in the season and uh we are really excited hi guys good morning everyone thanks for first of all thanks for the invitation it's a pleasure being here um can you guys hear me okay yes okay Felipe. um and Claire, thanks again for the invitation. Um, I think uh, my only concern is when you talk about um, you know, low cost, uh, high throughput phenotyping, when you get involved with drones and sensors, you know, it can get a little expensive really fast. <laughs> so 
um, <laughs> just keep that in mind. Um, so um, today, can I share my presentation? Okay. It is this one? Yeah. Okay, there we go. Here we go. So okay. uh, um, just, just uh, give information. Uh, for everyone there. So we are using internet and many devices. If someone here lost the connection, please stay there. We're gonna be right back. And guys, uh, feel free to stop and ask us for do anything. Claire and I, we go, we're gonna be right here. Just let me know if you need anything, okay? Yeah, um, we'll, we'll let you know if we have any questions in the chat for you as well. If you're watching, you can ask questions just in the chat on YouTube and we'll relay those to the speakers. Okay, here we go. Yeah, and please feel free to just stop and ask any questions at any time. This is to be much more of a conversation than a presentation. Uh, so the topic that Philippe asked us to, to talk about today would be the basics of drone flights and the distraction for small plot research. And um, I will be presenting along with uh, Diego Gris. Um, that uh, Diego is my uh, graduate uh, student here at AB. Um, so he was doing some great job on that regard. So to get started here, um, so some of the things that we'll talk about today, just an outline of the presentation. I just want to show you guys some of the sensors and drones that we have, um, provide some tips for drone data collection. I've been working with drones and data collection in small plots for the last six years or so. Uh, so there are a few things that we learned along the way. Um, Diego is gonna do uh, a live demo regarding mission planning, um, a quick uh, demo on images teaching. Um, and then he's gonna show some of the script that he have developed on plot drawing um, so we can extract the data uh, from those plots. And to finish off, I, I'm just gonna um, show you guys uh, some of the tools that we have developed in Python. Um, and uh, we have that connect into ArcGIS um, so we can extract the statistical uh, plot level statistics um, for hundreds or thousands of plots in a very short period of time. Um, so, to get started here, I just want to uh, introduce a little bit for my uh, research team. Uh, this is not something that we can do on our own. Uh, if it wasn't for some of the folks that you're seeing on your screen here, uh, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Zhao Zeng, um, his great um, colleague and I really enjoy uh, working with him. Uh, Dr. John Stenger, uh, so John has has been doing some uh, great job. He has developed some uh, image analysis tools as well uh, for some of the greenhouse work that we've been doing. He's doing a great job. And um, you can see as well some uh, pictures of some of the graduate students in the group. So to start with, I just wanna um, talk about a little bit about the, the different sensors that we have here and um, <clears throat> what we use them for some, somewhat. As you can see, we have a variety of sensors and um, we, the reason that we have so, so many is we have uh, several, places where we are flying. And in North Dakota, there are a few days during the summer that you can fly. So we need to be able to, in one day, if you can fly, visit the six, eight sensors. Um, <clears throat> so that, that way we can spread our crew around the state and collect all the data that we, we want. Uh, for those that are not familiar, we're starting here from the top left, uh, we have a, a matrix um, 210 uh, drone. It, um, it has two cameras on it just for display. We don't fly for those two cameras, actually. 
uh, most of the time we fly with this red auto mega sense auto camera. Um, but we have uh, the Centera 6X camera as well uh, that can be mounted to, to this drone or any of uh, this uh, MA200, uh, Matrix 200 drones. Um, next here, we have another, uh, we have a Matrix uh, 200 drone um, and we have a dual uh, MicroSense system um, on it um, that provides us instead five bands like uh, the Centera 6S and the MicroSense Autumn, they provide us uh, 10 bands, uh, multispectral uh, bands. So, um, and down here we have more of the, just the regular RGB drones that we have. Um, we have some, the Alto Evo 2 that we purchased recently. Uh, we have several Phantom 4s, uh, great, great, uh, you know, entry level drone for all those that are are starting there. And we have this one here, um, where we have um, a 42 megapixel camera mount on the Metro 600 Pro, and this system has as well uh, a PPK system because we are using the system to do some um, with mapping and we want to create some prescription maps from that imagery. So we need to have high accuracy um, on those images. I'm just gonna go back here on, on the iPad and uh, show in more detail some of the sensors, some of the things that we have. Um, just give me a second here. Can you guys hear me? Okay, nice. So as I was talking about, uh, here we have the, the mattress 210. Uh, the only difference that the 210 and the 200 is that 210, you can put the two cameras on. Uh, it has a dual gimbal on it. Uh, so uh, as you can see, these cameras, they are just con um, connected here. They, the advantage of this kind of system is that you know, the cameras can re be removed fairly easy. If you, if you just, uh, you know, there's a couple of cables here that are pulling from the camera, uh, but that's, that's what I, I like about this system. Um, it's fairly, fairly to, to pull the cameras uh, out. As you can see, as I was talking about the dual system, um, this system has a band um, multispectral system. Uh, is that the image coming through? Yeah, so um, this is our 10 band system. Um, just put this down here. Um, this is probably one of my favorite drones until I kind of came across the Dell Tel drones. And I would tell, uh, you know, there is a lot of things that you can do to just RGB imagery and with a, a Phantom 4 drone. This has a, a 20 megapixel camera, uh, depends how, how high and how much here you're flying, this might be a very good option uh, for your research um, needs. Um, this drone flies around 20 minutes or so. I don't think I ever flew more than 22 minutes. Even the DJI says they can fly around 28 minutes or so. Um, recently we focused a couple of these um, small Evo 2 orange drones, um, very small drones. And there's several things that I like about them. Uh, 
this one has a, a 48 megapixel sensor, but because of the, the size of the sensor, uh, the image quality, it's a, it can be a little better than the Phantom 4 Pro, uh, but because the Phantom 4 Pro has a bigger sensor, uh, it's not much better, but it is better. I, we flew over the same plots, just one drone after the other, and you can clearly see the, the difference in image quality. And the other thing that I really like about this drone it's it flies for probably a good five to ten minutes longer than the Phantom 4 Pro, uh, and that's it's a huge difference for us. So and it's so easy to fly. You just unfold the the arms and you you are ready to go. There's no propellers to be uh, put in place or anything like that. So that's the Evo 2. Uh, <clears throat> We have, uh, on the pictures you saw, we have some mattress, 600 drones, but we're kind of uh, walking away from that one. Uh, I heard the other day that the drone has been discontinued by DJI. So we have several models of this uh, mattress, uh, 200 models, and we have several cameras again, uh, that we can easily swap on those models uh, and not having to have a dedicated camera or a dedicated drone to carry a camera. So for example, if you wanna, <clears throat> uh, uh, if you have a Zemus X-T2 camera that's a RGB plus thermal camera, you can use, uh, easily swap uh, the camera on a drone and use that drone. Uh, you can do the same. The same thing with the, uh, the Alton. So, <clears throat> and uh, one thing with the Alton, and it's a little it's different from uh, the Centera camera, the SACS, is, is the Alton has a lower resolution uh, thermal camera on it as, as well. So for those interested in, in having some uh, thermal data, don't expect a uh, higher resolution of that imagery, uh, but it has a, a thermal um, layer there as well. You know, if you're looking just to have an overview from your fields, that might be um, a good option as well. Um, oh, so I forgot to mention uh, one thing about the, the evil uh, two drone is that it was designed to you know, fly for your phone. Uh, and one thing, and I have this on my slides later. I really don't. I really like to have on something like iPad Mini uh, to fly with because I just have uh, two bigger fingers. The screen size of a phone it doesn't fit my my finger size as well. Uh, so. This so the this uh, little holder here is pinned some somewhat, but not enough to hold uh, an iPad Mini. So we I ask a uh, our IT person here to just three D print a little holder for us that we can just put it here. We can expand this, put that head in and uh, hold that head in place. It works pretty well. Um, you know, the drone is very easy uh, to fly, collects great imagery. Um, <coughs> so that's basically uh, about our uh, sensors. Let me go back to, to my presentation here. All right, um, back here. Um, so 
You know, uh, I have been doing some a lot of a work with uh, plant breeders in our university, and they haven't seen, uh, especially the wheat and barley programs, haven't seen good, very good results from um, this land range uh, system. And unfortunately, I do I do not uh, process that data. Uh, it has some some proprietary um, formats there. They say that you can stitch in pigs for D, but I never could get that uh, done well. So, but they have their own platform to analyze the data, and the sensor is pretty nice actually. We're getting some very good results from it. Um, let's see if we can move ahead here. So, as I mentioned, uh, you know. I want to just go through some slides here and provide some tips on, on what we have learned uh, along the way during all this year's flying drones. And the first one is, you know, have a clear objective, what you want to do, because that is going to determine uh, what kind of drone you need. You know, uh, think about the cost of a, Auto sensor that to capture this image to the left here, uh, plus the drone, and something that you, you need to, to do, for example, is stand count or look in small plants like that. So, those are very different situations, and um, the, the, the uh, sensors need different features to collect that, that data. Uh, <clears throat> So, and of course the price too, you know, the price, the, the out on the drone and the drone, uh, you're probably looking at fifteen, sixteen thousand dollars $16,000 while you can buy a Phantom 4 Pro for 1600 to $2,000 for a couple batteries. So know what you want to do because, you know, that will um, determine what you need what kind of sensor or kind of drone you need. Um, the second thing is have a checklist. I don't know how many times uh, people, uh, my graduate students and myself, a couple of times run into this. Um, you know, you miss a cable, you miss a battery or a little thing, a SD card uh, on a box that you bring the field and you know you waste a, a two and a half three whatever how many hours you need to, to travel to your site so take the time create uh there is a lot of uh checklists online there um create a checklist for your drones make sure that uh on the day before you go there and check everything that needs to be checked uh, so you have everything ready for the flight. This is something that uh, a lot of graduate students in the department, they want to use the drones and they come in and ask, oh, can I use the drones? Like, yeah, have you charged the batteries? Do you have an SD card? And those kind of things. So make sure that you have those checklists and uh, have people follow them. Um, I, we have a couple of questions, if you don't mind just taking a quick break. All right, so I'll put the first one up. So the first one is from Progeny Drone, and they want to know if, in your experience, you've noticed any significant difference in stitching accuracy from cameras with gimbals versus cameras mounted without gimbals. Um, I haven't. You know, um, lately, I actually... Uh, as we move out from the Matrix 600 Pros to uh, the 200 series, um, you know, having a gimbal on that system becomes too heavy for those drones. And the way that they design the, uh, <clears throat> the mounts for some of those cameras, uh, especially the, the MicroSense ones that we use a lot, uh, I think they got to a point that the drone can maintain 
the stable and point the camera down all the time. And, and I haven't seen any uh, disadvantage of not having the gimbal during the stitching process. I think the quality is as good as uh, when we used to have the gimbals. Um, and it's not, you know, not easy to find a gimbal that worked well for those systems. If it's not those DJI type of gimbals, uh, have a third party gimbal, it works, but it needs uh, some adjustments and you know, some little tricks here and there. Okay, thank you. And the other one is a shorter question. Jen was just wondering if you would be able to make your slides available so she can oh, see. Of course. Yeah. We can definitely make those slides available. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the third one, I think I, I already mentioned is uh, you know, tablet versus phone. The, the phone is nice, it's small, uh, but I found that something the size of an iPad mini for me works the best. So it has a nice size um, <clears throat> and allows me to um, zoom in and out from the areas where I need to fly. Um, and be careful sometimes people, oh, I wouldn't mind it to have a, a full size iPad. But be careful that sometimes um, the, um, the mount on the remote controller, the drone, does not have enough uh, space to fit a full size iPad on those. And you know, when you're flying for uh, an hour or two holding that iPad and that remote control, it becomes quite heavy. So for me, um, something the size of iPad mini is the perfect uh, size. Um, regarding apps, there are tons, tons of apps that one can use there. You know, we can spend two hours just talking about apps if you want. Uh, but for me, uh, my fav favorite app is Pix4D Capture. Uh, the capture reason, The reasons for, for it is uh, I really, um, see, I really like this kind of features that uh, these templates that Pix4D has. Um, I mostly find the time and flying grid flights, but I like that it has the option for easily create um, a double grid for 3D models and polygons. And one of the things that uh, <clears throat> that uh, Pixar D Capture had since the beginning was the fact that when you're drawing a polygon, it gives you the distance on both the directions. Um, <clears throat> and for me, some of the missions that we do that is um, is really nice to know. And I will, I will show you in just a minute a situation where that can place really well. <clears throat> Another question that I, or thing that I see a lot is, you know, uh, when is it too windy to fly? And I was talking with one of my graduate students this morning, and I found that this, um, a table online yesterday, and I, was, I thought it was interesting to share, uh, just because of the analogy they make some under the environment there. Uh, but you know, if you look at the drones specs, especially DJI drones, you know, I'm not afraid of flying a drone at 20, 25 miles an hour wind. The drone for most most time we would take it just fine my main question for you that the, you know but for those that are flying at that wing to collect the data from uh, crops is what is the behavior of the crop on that kind of wing you know it i always kind of think about for example a soybean field or soybean plots whatever you want to look at but in a 20 mile uh, an hour wind. So as you're going down one pass on the field, you might be able to, you might be taking uh, pictures from the top of the leaves, right? 
Now, when you're coming back, because the wind is moving the, the crop all the way around, you might be able, might be taking pictures from the bottom of the woods. And the question for me, the rise for me is, what is the quality of that data? The, um, the stitching process, how that affects the stitching process. So for me, most of the time, it, it, if it's wind is blowing consistently over 13, 15 miles an hour, uh, I usually don't fly. So and that, the question is not, the drone cannot fly. The drone can fly just fine, but the quality of the data. Um, another thing that I've seen, uh, you know, um, is, okay, you, you risk to fly uh, a plot or whatever, a trial, and you're giving either some of these uh, conditions. You have, you know, a polygon where the trial is, you have, the, you have uh, flags or stakes where you can see the trial or maybe you have a, just a, a GPS coordinate for one of the corners of the track. So the main question is, where do you fly? Where do you start your flight? How do you, you know, figure out the best place to, to start your mission? And um, let's start looking at this situation here. Um, so if you, if you see this, if I ask you, any of you, to do a flight here um, on this location, where would you park your car and take off? No. One could say, oh, I could park here. There's the road here. I can park easily park here and take off and fly this. Yes, you could. My main question is, this is the only thing that you know you know this polygon, but you don't know this distance. How far can do you have to go here? For me, the easiest way to do it, you know, as you can see, um, some futures on the on the map here. If you can drive over here and turn the drone on, you know, you're gonna find exactly where the drone is. And now you know that you can you fly to the edge of these trees into the street here, and you can find, uh, you know, you cover your area of interest, no problem with that. Now, this is a, another situation um, that we come across very often. We have uh, the four um, corners of a, a trial, and we want to fly that, um, but we don't know distances or anything uh, from these points, but you can basically walk to any of these flags and, and find the corners. Where where should we take off? Where should we place our drone to start our mission? You know, uh, in my case, this for me, I can see when I'm out on this field, I can see this tree line here. So what I usually do, I would park right here, okay, and walk with the drone to this point here. Because I don't know the distance, but if I I place the drone on the ground and turn it on, it's going to show on my iPad where it is. And from here, I can just draw um, a polygon, you know, a rectangle, and place all over this area here, because I know that he has to fly up to these trees and up this tree, and that's the way um, that I would place the mission here. And the cool thing, the other cool thing that I like about Pix for the capture is if I do this once, the mission gets saved, and I can just fly the mission over and over again. So. The second time that would be flying this field, it doesn't matter. I could park here or here because I know uh, I have the mission already. So for the, the, the main trick here is the first time to fly. If you have a, an app that can save the, the missions, um, so the second, third time you have the mission, that's not a problem. Um, 
And this here uh, was a situation where I have a collaborator and he gave me the, uh, <clears throat> just the coordinates, latitude and longitude of the state from uh, one of his trials that he wants to, to be flown. And he told me it's, you know, 175, 185 feet uh, west of that point, and then 575 feet south. So uh, again, if you can find at this point in the field, you know, uh, and you put your drone closer to this point. Um, now, again, with the picks for the capture, I can just draw a polygon that's 200, 250 feet west of that point and 600 feet or whatever, 650 feet south of it. And I know exactly uh, my mission should be. And, you know, that makes uh, much, much easier to uh, to make your missions. So with that, I will turn um, the presentation over to Diego. Thank you, Paulo. Paulo. Uh, I want to I thank you guys too for inviting both Paulo and I uh, to do this, this workshop. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here talking to these people that follow the Phenome Force group. And uh, as Paulo was explaining a lot about what you have to take into consideration when you are going to the field uh, to fly and how you start planning the mission, I will follow up with the hands-on part of how we plan the mission in Pix4D once we are at the field. Of course, we're not at a field here, so you guys have to imagine that we are somewhere with crops and we are in one of those coordinates uh, that somebody gave us or close to one of the stakes that marks one of the corners of the field. But I would like to share the screen on an iPad that is connected to, to one of the Phantom Fours that we have here, the one that Paulo just showed us. And first you can see that we have a bunch of apps uh, on our iPads. Uh, these are all apps that we can use to fly. But as, as Paulo was saying, we usually prefer to fly Pix 4D Capture. In some cases, there are some cameras that we need to use other apps. They don't work with Pix 4D Capture, but our preferred one is Pix 4D Capture on the iOS platform. Uh, so I have the drone on, turned on over there. Of course, we are inside a building, so the drone is not, doesn't have any GPS data. It cannot see any satellites here. But uh, what I want to explain is once you get to the field uh, and you set up everything, how do you start planning a mission? Uh, actually, I would like to share a video first. Uh, I made a video uh, at the field showing how we set up the drone and everything, and then we can go from there. So this video is muted because there was too much wind and uh, we cannot hear anything from the video. So I'm going to explain what I'm doing. So you go to the field and I'm using a Phantom 4, so I open the case and then you will remove the camera cover that is in the Phantom 4. This is, you know, for the Phantom 4. And here I'm putting the propellers on. Uh, I'm explaining, you know, the propellers that are two types. They rotate in different directions, so they have different colors. Uh, two of them have a black circle around them and they match with black dots on the rotors. So you have to make sure that you are putting them in the right place, otherwise they are not going to go in and you might break if you try to, to put in the wrong place. So I'm putting all of the propellers. Uh, they also have a, a direction that you have to rotate in order to lock. So initially you just put the propeller on top of the rotor. You, you try to find the right position where it goes down a little bit and then you should hold the 
the arm of the of the of the drone and then you push it down and you rotate to the lock position that are symbols for lock and unlock over the uh, on the road uh, sorry on the on the propeller so you know which direction because two they two of them rotate in one direction the other two rotate in the other direction so we have to be careful with that and then we follow by inserting the battery uh, the Phantom 4 takes a single battery. It also has a, a right side to go in. So make sure you have that figured out. And then you just push it in and make sure that it's well fitted inside. Otherwise, uh, sometimes the drone might turn on, but when you try to take off, it will not take off because it, uh, the battery is not, is not correctly in place. Uh, then we can grab the remote controller. Everything is off until now, so, you know, Put the antennas up remember to do that that's important for the communication with the drone and then open the ipad holder and then you can put the ipad in place uh, then you need an usb cable to connect the ipad to the remote controller so i'm just getting the ipad cable and connecting the cable to the ipad and to the back of the controller so that they can communicate And then uh, you turn on the remote controller. For DJI drones, you have to press twice and hold the second time you press for one or two seconds and the remote controller turns on. Now I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna look for a place uh, where to put the drone in order to take off. Phantom 4 is a little hard because the camera is really close to the ground, you know, so you have to find a place with kind of very flat ground so that the camera doesn't touch the soil uh, when you are flying it's actually much better to have like a piece of plywood or something where you can take off from but uh, on this day i didn't have anything so i just found a, a place with flat soil no not a lot of dirt underneath so that the camera wouldn't touch there and then you turn on the drone by pressing twice on the power button in the battery works the same as the remote controller And drone is on, it automatically connects to the remote controller. And since the controller is connected to the iPad, the iPad can also identify that the remote controller, uh, the, uh, the drone is connected. And here I want to stop and go back to my iPad screen because, so I set up the, I, I set up the drone in the field and what we usually do after that is we turn on everything we turn on the drone and everything and then we have to plan the mission let's say it's the first time that i'm flying a certain area uh i need i still need to plan the mission so first thing usually uh, when when we are at the field sometimes if you just go straight and plan the mission and do everything and everything looks good and you 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 try to start the flight, you try to take off, and the app is going to send a signal to take off, but the drone simply does not do anything. And, and then Pix4D capture doesn't tell you anything either. You know, it doesn't know what the problem is. For the, for the Pix4D app, the drone is flying, the drone is taking off, but you can see that it's not. So what usually happens is there might be uh, a problem with the compass. You know, sometimes you have to calibrate the drone's compass. So what, what I usually do once you turn on the drone before you open Pix4D Capture to, to, to plan the mission, I open the DJI app. So this app will tell you all everything about the drone. And in the case of uh, the Phantom 4, the app is the DJI Go 4. So if I open it, you can see that it says the drone is connected uh, to the iPad. And if I go to the fly to fly and i don't know why it just disconnected now okay so there we go so it's going to open this app uh, and we have a bunch of information we can actually see the the camera live stream so the drone is back there and we are here and i just want to show up here in the corner if you you, you can see that it says cannot take off. And of course, it's because we are inside a building. And also, uh, 
we are really close to the Fargo airport. So this is a no fly zone. So it tells me here that it cannot take off because we are in low fly zone because it's too close to the Fargo airport. But what I want to see is here, we have the compass information and for now it's normal. So the compass is calibrated, but sometimes you might come here and you, you will see that it, it tells you you need to recalibrate. And then you just click on calibrate and it's going to tell you what you have to do in order to calibrate the compass. It's pretty straightforward. Before you go back, we just have a question about um, the PIX4D capture. Uh, the question yes. is, is it possible to adjust the camera settings using the iOS version of PIX4D capture? Yes. Yep. I'm just going to show that right now. Perfect. Okay. okay. So once I check the compass, I know the drone is good to fly, good to go. I'll go to PIX4D. And the first thing I'm going to do is check on the main settings up here if I have the correct drone and camera set up. So I want to fly a Phantom 4. So I'll come here and check if, I've sel I, if I have selected the Phantom 4 and the right camera, OK? Because, for example, if I'm going to fly an M200, the Matrix 200 with a, the dual system, I might have to come over here and select the right drone, which is down here, Matrix 200. And I have to select the right camera. And one thing, Pix4D Capture does not have native support for every camera. So you can see that we have a bunch of custom cameras down here. These ones we had to insert manually. And how we do this is we, we already have, of course, it set up here. But if you don't have one, you might have to insert a new camera. But I just want to show here how what information you need. Uh, so you can give any name. We uh, this is for the dual system camera, or for or for the single camera. If you're using just a red camera, it works the same. And you need this information: focal length, the sensor width, image width, and image height. And this is usually info that you can find just by with a quick search on Google. Okay, so if you uh, if you search on Google for uh, Mica Sense, uh, Red Ed, uh, MX Red, uh, Pix4D camera setup or Pix4D capture camera settings, uh, they have available on their website all this information. Okay. So in this case, I'm planning a mission for a Phantom 4 Pro V2. So I'm going to go back here, select this. And of course, the Phantom 4 has its own camera. So it's the default one. I'm not going to change anything. I'll just disable this auto download. I don't want that. And then I can go and start planning a mission. So here we have a mission that has been planned in the past. OK, so you might open the app and it just throws you somewhere. You know, you don't know where it is. Uh, there is a button down here, just like any Maps application, to go to your current location. So I'll hit that button. And it comes to the current location. So, I mean, this is the location of the iPad. You can see, you we cannot see the drone here because, like I said, you can even see here that there are zero satellites because the drone, of course, cannot see any satellites inside the building. So when you are out at the field, you you can see the, the drone location too. You know, it, little, it shows a symbol for the drone. Uh, the blue dot over here is just the location of the iPad. So it works anyway. And of course, we are at NDSU here inside a building. So I don't want, we are not going to fly here. So I'll just, let's, I'll just pretend that I, I have to fly a field somewhere, you know, in a research location, a research plot or something. Here we go. We have some research plots in a NDSU research area. So first thing you're going to do is you're going to come to that area and then you can just hit the button in the center and it's going to automatically create a grid uh, based on the last size that you created. And what is nice, uh, as Paulo was saying, we really like Pix4D Capture because you can rotate easily, you can move the area 
and you can adjust the sizes using the green using the green uh, buttons and you just press and slide and if you look in the bottom down here it automatically tells you what's the size in both directions and how much how much time it's going to take to fly this area based on the settings that you have so let's say i want to adjust a flight over this area so i'm not going to do everything perfectly it's just to show but you see it's pretty easy to do you know and what what else we have to adjust here on the side we have the flight height the flight altitude from the from the ground you know so let's say i want to fly at 100 feet so i can just roll this slider here to 100 feet it also automatically tells you based on the flight altitude what's the ground sample distance so at 100 feet with the phantom 4 camera we're gonna have a a pixel size of 0.33 inches per pixel and another other settings you might check is up here on the settings button so here we have a lot of adjustments too so angle of the camera of course if you're flying for agriculture you're basically flying at 90 degrees uh, the front and side overlap we usually choose between 75 and 80 percent you know 75 percent is usually good enough for good stitching so that's what we usually use if you increase the overlap of course it means you have to do more passes over the field in order to uh, to take all these pictures so it, it will take longer and these are basically the settings that we usually adjust you know the rest of the settings you don't usually don't have to to change anything so basically front and side overlap it's what we change and just make sure that the the camera is set for an angle of 90 degrees to fly and then once you go back before you fly again just look at this panel on the right and make sure you have the right drone selected the right camera selected if they are not right just go back to home go to the app settings and change that make sure you have enough battery for the flight so you know usually you want to start the flight with both uh drone and can and remote controller at 100 percent so this is the drone battery the first one the second one is the remote controller um so you might want to start at 100 percent or if it's a very very short flight you you can start uh with lower battery but it's always safer of course to to have 100 percent battery the drone automatically comes back uh, when it reaches 20%, and that's a setting that you can adjust, but we usually adjust it to come back home at 20%. So if your flight is longer than 20 minutes, for example, that's how long the Phantom 4 can usually, can usually fly, uh, it's going to come back home at 20%, and then you turn it off, switch batteries, and take off again and keep and continue the flight and pix4d will automatically just go to whatever it stop it and continue flying from there and taking the rest of the pictures number of satellites usually you know when you are outside you have enough so it it will just tell you here how many satellites you have and another thing make sure you have an sd card inserted in either the drone in the case of the phantom 4 or the camera if the sd card goes in the camera because you might go fly the app might let you fly and do everything and then when you come back to to your office you're going to notice that you didn't capture any any pictures because you forgot to insert an sd card so make sure you have an sd card with the phantom 4 you can actually see how much space you have left which is nice but for example when you are flying the matrix 200 with uh, most of the cameras since the sd card is in the camera uh the this app cannot cannot communicate with the sd card directly so you're not going to see anything here it's going to show as if you didn't have any sd card so you have to physically make sure that you have an sd card inserted on both cameras or whatever camera you're flying and then once you have all this checked we can go back to my video yeah where you, uh you have yes. some questions uh, some questions here before going yes here we go the first one what about the camera 
shooter speed, iOS sensitivity, and exposure? Uh, we, we, you know, for, for an RGB flight for, with the Phantom 4, we usually don't, we just use the default settings. Paulo, I don't know if you have any, yeah, we, we usually just use the default settings. So, I mean, I can show if you, can you, if you share my iPad screen again. Uh, so, you know, Pix4D has, for example, this white balance. So we usually leave it in auto, you know, mm -hmm. it automatically just sets the, all these, you know, uh, ISO speed and, and, and the amount of light is capturing based on the light, light conditions, just like any, any camera, you know, in auto mode. So we usually fly that way, you know, okay. for RGB, we usually, I mean, we have been getting good data, you know, flying this way. So yeah, we don't, we don't mess with these settings in general. Okay. There is a following question for that one, also from Progeny. Mm -hmm. uh, what about picture mode as manual, shooter priority? Uh, so, okay. So look at grid center. No, that's the setting we use, you know, and picture trigger mode we use, you know, if you, if it's a short flight, so safe mode means uh, the drone is going to fly a little, uh, you know, the drone is going to fly uh, at a reduced speed in order to make sure that it has enough time to take, to click the pictures and process them to store them, you know. Okay. Oh, I can, sorry. I yes. can include Paulo here to in this question. Yes. This one. So, yeah, Paulo <laughs> just corrected me. I didn't. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, safe mode. Safe mode takes a lot of time because the drone is actually going to stop at each place that it wants to take a picture, mm -hmm. and then take the picture, and then fly again. Okay, so we don't use that setting because that just takes too long, too long to fly. So we go for fast mode, and then drone speed. Uh, again, if you have, you know, if it's a small area, you have plenty of time. You might set to normal drone speed, so it flies a little slower and maybe you know maybe you you know depending on the wind or the conditions you might get i mean the drone might it's flying at a lower speed so it might shake less or something but if you are short on i mean like if you are in between having a 20 minute and 21 minute flight that might take two batteries and a 18 minute flight that you can fly in a single battery you you can just go for fast you know i don't think in my experience, I don't think I ever had any issues, you know, flying on fast speed. Uh, like the drone can capture all the pictures that it needs. You know, the, the app is very intelligent. So like the Pixar D app, once it has the settings for the camera, uh, like either the for the Phantom 4 camera, it already has all the settings um, or the ones that you input there if you need a custom to customize the camera. It calculates all these, so you know it. It makes the drone fly at a speed that is, that is, you know, it's is low enough so that the drone can capture and store all the pictures. All right. So these are usually the settings that we use: fast mode, fast drone speed, and auto white balance. And, and then you know, this ignore home point is important too. You know, you want to say no because. Uh, once you are starting the flight, it goes through a pre-flight checklist. And if your home point is too far away from your current location, uh, it's going to throw, you know, a, a warning that, you know, your home point is too far, which means once, you know, once you take off or once the mission is ended, it's going to, the drone would fly all the way, could be miles away to the, to the home point that was set before. So you want to leave this no to ignore home point so you want it to check the home point and make sure that it's close enough all right yeah i think right. so the take Any home more questions? the take home is uh start with the default and then you go adjust yeah the start so with the default and you know as you get more experience as you you know learn more about flying you might uh, you might you know you might see a need to change some more advanced settings 
or for a specific purpose, you know, like Paulo was saying, flying, you know, 10% is going out there, planning the mission picks for the capture or whatever app and flying, you know, it's, okay. uh, it all comes okay. from uh, knowing, you know, ha like based on what's the purpose of your flight, what kind of data you want to collect comes all the way to selecting drone, selecting camera, you know, selecting the right time to fly. So there's a lot of variables and these, yeah. you know, a lot of these comes with experience. Yeah, great. Oh, there is another question here. Do you want to answer now or later? Uh, could be now since. Here we go. Uh, how picks for the capture accept or adjusted with any new camera, for example, Sony to out capture image during the flights? Uh, I don't know if I got that correctly, but you mean how Pix4D for the capture adjust the flight settings based on the camera that you have? Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, probably, uh, is that auto recognizment? So, system? I mean, if, so for example, if you are flying, like we have a Sony, a Sony camera in one of the big drones. So, you know, it's a regular camera that you know, it's a professional camera and it is on a drone. So you would come here and add this custom camera. And again, you know, you would put your Sony camera and you have to find this information, focal length, sensor width, and the image width and height that okay. from that camera, you know. So again, this is usually information that you can find on the internet. Like all these are, you know, the specs of the camera that you're using. So once you and the minimum triggering interval, you you need to know, you know, how what's the minimum time your camera needs to store each picture it takes. So some cameras can store in microseconds. Some cameras might take one second to store. Some cameras might take even more, even longer. You know, so you need to set up here. And usually, you know, let's say if your camera needs at least one second we would put here like 1.2 seconds, you know, just to make sure that the camera will have enough time to store. And I don't know if this answered the question, but based on only this info, the app automatically, you know, plans the mission for you. So you don't have to worry about anything anymore. Once you set these settings here correctly, uh, when you are planning the mission back here and you have that camera selected again, you know, just make sure you have that camera selected for the mission. It's going to adjust the number of passes that you have here based on those settings that you, you know, combining those settings with the overlap and of course with the height that you are flying. So you're going to see that if I change the height, you see the number of passes. I, I'm flying higher, so I, I don't, I don't need that that many passes or if i'm flying let's say 66 feet i need more passes so it automatically just combining this information here with the information about the camera i hope that answers the question yeah all right thank you it was great uh so can we go back to the video yes so once i plan the mission uh uh i you know then I will, I'll, I just want to pause it for now. I will just check that everything is right. You know, check your surroundings, of course, make sure there's no, air, no other aircraft flying around you. Uh, again, make sure the wind, I mean, if there is too much wind, you're not even gonna try to fly. So at this time, all those things that Paulo talked about should be checked already, but right before you fly, you know, just do a final checkup to make sure your flight mission is, is correctly set. Uh, make sure there's no obstruction uh, for the drone to take off. And, and usually, you know, it's important. Actually, that's a requirement. You, you, if you have more people with you, you must let everybody around know that you are taking off so that people pay attention and don't get too close to the drone. And then you're gonna hit the start button on the... Can you just go back real quick to to my screen? So you're gonna hit the start button on the bottom right. And like I said, it's gonna tell you that it's connected. And when you hit next, it's going to do this 
takeoff checklist. And of course, I have a lot of errors here because I don't have GPS, you know, home point is too far. You can see that, that error here. But once you are at the field and everything is good, everything will turn green here. And then there will be a, a button to start on the right, on the on this part of the, there will be a button to start the flight. And once you hit that button, the drone will automatically take off. So back to the video again. Sorry. And so you hit start. So I just hit start, the drone takes off and you don't have to do anything, you know, with planet missions, you don't, you basically do not manually control. So uh, I just keep it to the, you know, to the end of the mission. So I'm talking about usually when it's landing, you know, try to have the sun at your back so that you can look up and see the drone. You know, you are not blinded by the sun. So the drone is coming back automatically. You know, once it ends the mission, it's going to, it's going to come back to the home point and then start landing. It comes down automatically. So you don't have to do anything. Just keep paying attention to the drone. See if it's coming to a good position. And once it gets close to the ground, it's going to slow down and sometimes stop for you and then you can adjust the location where you're gonna land you know so you know i don't want to land where there's rough terrain or something so you you're gonna see that i'll just move the drone a little forward and then it lands automatically and then you're done uh and just so this was the phantom 4 now i just want to show the setup for the m200 it's a little more complicated so same thing you know we went to the field. It's up to 12. So, you know, the M200 is, is uh, higher, uh, it's bigger and it's a little harder to set up. So since uh, we are using the Mica dual system camera, we have these GPS antenna and uh, and it the and the downlight sensor it's the same so you, you just put it up fix it in place and then the m200 you have to attach the legs so you know you open that latch insert the legs in and close it to hold it in place and then you insert the second leg Then you can set it down on the ground and you open the arms. And then you have to slide that piece in and rotate it to the lock position. Again, there are symbols telling you in which direction you have to rotate them to lock. And then I'll just advance uh, here. I'm getting the propellers. Again, these propellers also have color codes. So I'm just showing here one of them has a gray color and the other one is completely black and they match markings on the rotors. So make sure you insert them in the right place. And again, go very carefully, just set it on top, rotate a little bit, it goes down a little bit. And once you see that it goes down, you can push it down and lock it in place. So you do this for all the rotors for all the propellers, make sure you're putting them in the right position. And then the M200 takes two batteries. So they go in the back of the drone. So you slide them in until you hear a click. And this is all, you know, that are, you can find all this info online. You know, this is our, our purpose here is to do a, a very basic of fly for drone flights, you know, so for people who have maybe have flown drones already, you know, you probably already know all these. So the batteries are in, and then we can put the camera in place. So I'm grabbing the the MicaSense MX Red dual system. So just remember to remove the camera covers. 
and then it's a little tricky to put them in sometimes but they have a right direction to go in so you know the connector should be on the left right direction uh, with the drone that's where that's how the connector on the drone is placed and then there so the red camera goes in the front so you try to go up in this direction you can see that it's i had some trouble putting it it's usually a little harder to put it in but then once it goes up you just rotate it so that the red camera is forward until you hear a click and then you just make sure that it's that it's fixed in place and then there is a cable the cable that comes from the gps antenna you have to connect that to the camera mount so i'm just connecting the cable and uh, you know it's more to show you know so just showing you know there are a lot of things that you have to be careful in order to to make everything work so for example if you forget these these cable you know the camera will not turn on basically uh, or the camera will not communicate with the gps so you probably won't capture all the pictures you need and here you know the the mica sense cameras they have they have a calibration panel that you have to take a picture of before you fly so uh you have to remember to bring this calibration panel every time you go to the field you can take a picture either before or after the flight uh here i'm gonna take a picture before the flight so you know just set this panel on the ground and then I'm gonna I, I'm showing how you take this picture manually if you are you know alone if you don't have anyone to help you you can use your cell phone you have to connect to the camera's Wi-Fi you know that's that's a long process that uh, unfortunately we don't have the time to show everything here but uh, once you are logged into that system you just you just go over the 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 panel and click capture on your phone and it's gonna trigger the camera and, and capture that that reflectance panel and then you can set the drone back and start flying so that's that's done for the for the field process you know flying basically once the drone is back you're just going to 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 put everything back in the case and come back come back to your office and do we have any questions yeah so there's someone who had a question if it would be possible to do the same type of thing with a, a non-professional drone so more of like a fun drone than a, a professional drone just to yes. try it out mm -hmm. this it's the same process for you know these cheap these more less expensive drones you know that uh, a lot of people have uh they I think they can you can plan you can plan a mission you know with these apps and fly with with that camera are there limitations like do, would all drones be compatible with pix 4 d or do they just have a, a list you know no so not all drones are compatible yeah they have a list so yeah you can you can customize the camera but you cannot insert a drone that's not supported by it for the no because there's okay. there's certainly a lot of things that they have to 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 care about you know when i mean a lot of settings that they have to adjust for each drone mm -hmm. so yeah they they have they you can only fly the drones that they support okay that's good and there was another question that got um taken out but i'll i'll add it back in um someone asked if you do any sort of ground truthing with your drones like comparisons to so yeah we usually do so i mean uh if you go back to the first video uh you can see there is an uh, there is an orange lead just on the left of the video so that's one of our ground control points so yes uh for some flights in order to have a very good uh positioning accuracy for the ortho mosaic we usually put uh, eight ground control points uh, around the area, you know, usually four, one in each corner and four inside the area. 
from these eight, five of them we use as actual ground control points to stitch the imagery, and three of them are just checkpoints, just to check if the uh, if uh, the position is is good, you know, if the accuracy of the of the coordinates is good, and then we we collect the coordinates from these control ground control points with an RTK uh, GPS, you know, so a handheld RTK GPS that gives us a uh, two centimeter accuracy. And then once you you stitch this imagery, uh, you can you can you know use these ground control points to better align the ortho mosaic. Okay. But not for all flights, you know. Yeah. It, it depends on the purpose of what what you need to do. You know, the advantage is that after you draw, for example, after you draw the plots, uh, if you if you always have ground control points for flights of the same field the plots will always follow exactly in the same area. If you don't use the ground control points, you know, the GPS on the drone might not be that accurate. It's, there's always some, might be a couple meters, you know, of, of error. So, you know, the imagery do not align perfectly. So you might have to draw plots for, for all, every single flight. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. And I think we're good to move on to your next yes. step. So next part would be stitching. Uh, Paulo, can you show Pix4D uh, on your computer? So I, I'll just switch back to Paulo so that he can just show Pix4D and process the initial process of stitching. Yeah, uh, you guys need to share one screen. Yeah, very great, Diego. Congrats. Uh, yeah. That was a really nice presentation. Here we go. Yes, so we can see uh, Pix4D screen. So, I mean, we use Pix4D capture to fly, and then once you come back, you're basically going to get the SD card, download the pictures to your computer, and then we 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 use Pix4D mapper to stitch the imagery. You know, so as Paulo was saying, sometimes flying can be a little expensive. You know, Pix4D mapper is a paid software. There are some, of course, there are some open source platforms that you can use to stitch imagery but since in our lab we have the license for pix4d mapper uh we use uh we use it to to stitch the imagery so paulo can you just start a new project and and just show how we load the imagery up to the point before we stitch so we're just going to show real quick how the process go on pix4d so once you open Pix4D and you click on new project, uh, you're going to set up a name for that project and then the location where you want to save the project itself, which is usually somewhere, you know, where you already have, where you have put your pictures. And then once you go next, you're going to add all the images that you took with the drone. So you can go to add directory, for example, and add the folders that have the imagery from the drone. So it gets all those images. And when you hit next, it will load those images. And then it will show you all the information, you know, the GPS coordinates, longitude, latitude, altitude, uh, the accuracy of the GPS coordinate uh, of that drone, uh, the datum, you know, all the information about coordinates. Usually you don't have to do anything here. So, you know, you can just move forward. And then here's the some settings about, uh, again, the coordinate system and what's going to be the output coordinate system. Usually it's automatically detected. So, again, you just go next. And then you have to select a template 
to stitch the imagery. So Pix4D Mapper has some templates. Uh, so those standard ones that you can see, for example, 3D maps, 3D models, the ones in the middle. So these are the standard ones. But there are a lot of settings that you can adjust. And as you start stitching imagery, you might want to change some settings. And then you can save uh, personalized templates. So in our lab, we have a bunch of templates for each drone and each camera that we have with some adjusted settings. So you, you can select the template. For example, we have a template for the Phantom 4 Pro. And then you can finish setting up the project. And once you finish setting up, it's going to show you, so each red, each red circle on the screen is one of the captures of the camera. So you can see that the flight was pretty good. And if you click on the cameras, it shows you the actual picture, the single picture. And down at the bottom, you have the processing panel with the three steps. So we have three steps for processing. If you don't have ground control points, you can just hit start with all of them uh you know together and you can just leave it processing you know for this part you you will want to have a powerful computer with a lot of processing power and a lot of memory so that it's faster you know because it's teaching the imagery requires quite a lot of processing power so you can just hit start and leave it running and once it's done you will have the ortho mosaic okay so once you have the ortho mosaic done we since we are talking here about small plots field research, we usually have to draw these plots uh, on a GIS environment. So for those of you who are following, uh, if you if you have gone to, Felipe, can you share my screen again? Yes, so if you have gone to my GitHub page, I have a plugin for QGIS that draws plots. So I'm just gonna show real quick how we use that plugin. So uh, there is some sample data. If you downloaded the the code from GitHub inside the folder, inside the draw plots QGIS main, uh, you have the sample data folder. And this is the data that I'm using just to show here. This is a sample of, you know, a five band. It's the MicaSense red camera. So it has five bands. And for this sample data, I changed the order of the bands. So here they are red, green, blue, uh, near, and red edge. So this is not the default uh, order, so don't get confused. So if you installed everything correctly, uh, on, my, on my GitHub page, I have all the, you know, I have a tutorial of how to, in, I know, how to set up this plugin in order to use it. So after you go through that tutorial, you should see on the processing toolbox in QGIS, you should see the R script and, and then these draw trial plots, which are my, my plugins. And I have four different plugins. They take different inputs. So you can draw plots by clicking on the screen to get the coordinates of where you want to draw them. Or you can have an input from an Excel file or for a point vector or for a polygon vector. All of them come with a help, you know, description of how to use it. So you can find a lot of information here. I hope that uh, people can understand how to use the plugin just looking at this help. But I'm going to show how to use this one, which is from clicks, which is the nicest one, I think, because I ask for the bottom left corner of the trial. So if you just click here and then you have this coordinate capture tool and I want the bottom left corner of the trial regardless of uh, of you know geographic orientation so in my case the bottom left is in the southwest corner but sometimes the bottom left corner of your trial setup at the field could be up here on this corner and and your trial runs you know west east so you know you have to consider all uh, these but in my case I will click down here which is the origin of my trial. And then I also need to capture the top left corner. And the top left corner is just to, so that the, the tool knows the orientation. Oh, like you can see that these plots, they are not perfectly aligned in north-south. So this is so that the plots are rotated accordingly 
to the to the rotation of your plots at the field. And then here, this is an example. This is sample data from an, a, you know, a trial that has multiple blocks. So number of blocks here, I have three blocks. So it's block one, block two, and block three. And there are two ranges per block. So block, this is the first block, range number one and the range number two. And plots per range is the number of plots, in this case, from left to right. So I have 15. ID format could be sequential, which means they go, let's say, 1 to 15, come back, and then 16 to uh, 30. Or serpentine, which is 1 to 15, go up, come back, 16 to 30. And I want to start from the bottom left, numbering these plots. Uh, and blocks always start on the same side in serpentine format. Yes, again, if you need the help here, describes what all these settings mean, you know. Uh, measurement units, they I'm going to input them in feet. If you have them in meters, you can just change here. And then here, full plot width means, you know, like all the plots, if they were touching each other. So in my case, these plots have about 5.2 feet wide and 20 feet height and the data plot width is just the the size of the final plot you know just over the plants so i will have a size of let's say 4.7 4.7 feet wide then uh 13 feet high and once you have all these settings you just click the run button if it's the first time you are running it might take a while more because it, it has to install the packages in r that are required you know, in my computer I already have that installed so you can see it's pretty quick once you have the packages installed so here they are you know uh i forgot to mention you know these plots every plot is composed of two rows of plants so i just want to get rid of the field color here so that we can see just the border of the plots. And then when I hit OK, so, you know, you might have to try a few times with changing the sizes and the position so that they, the plots fall over the right location. But what is most interesting about this tool is the ability to label the plots in a lot of different forms, you know, because Usually you're going to be working with a researcher or something and they already have their labels that they use to collect data in the field. And, and you have to match these labels when you draw these plots. So, so I just need to do this so that I can see. No, sorry, I just want to show. Yes. So you see, I asked for labels that start on the bottom left and go in a serpentine format. So we start at 101, go to 115. One, the first number is the no, block number. So block number one, plot number one. Goes, comes back 30. Then block number two goes and comes back, block number three. So, you know, sometimes uh, you might draw, there are a lot of tools that can draw plots, but most of them don't have these labeling capabilities. So you might have to manually label. In the tool that I created, I try to, you know, put as many labeling options as as we could think of. Of course, it doesn't cover all the, you know, all the all the uh, trial formats that you might find, uh, but you know, it, it it covers a bunch of ways of to label the plots. And then once you draw the plots, uh we are going to go back to Paulo and Paulo just demonstrate what we can do with the plot strong and the ortho mosaic, the stitched imagery. Excuse me. <clears throat> A second here, I'm gonna pull something up, but I'm gonna remote desktop on my my computer in my office. Share my screen. Share here. Okay.
Can you see my screen? Yes. Can you see my screen now? OK. So um, something funny. Just stop the blinking. Okay, so as Jacob mentioned, uh, you know, once every we have the plot drones, that's where I can apply some of the the scripts that we have developed to pull some of the data out from these plots for our research group. Uh, <clears throat> can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, so. Um, I I work with uh, a little bit of Python and ArcGIS, and the reason that I work with ArcGIS is because I have a ten years or so or more of experience in ArcGIS. So I know uh, I think of true about how doing things in Arc, um, and. Um, a lot of universities have access, a lot of researchers have access to, to ArcGIS as well. So a lot of what I do and tools that I develop, I develop with based on ArcGIS. So as you can see here, we have a, a developer, a create a, a toolbox that they call whatever, US imagery. But we have several tools that we can uh, used to calculate the vegetation indices and extract data from from plots, ground cover, uh, from different cameras, RGB cameras, multispectral cameras. Um, so there's a when you're you're dealing with the imagery, um, you know, there is a lot of steps that have to happen um, to get to a point where you read to extract the data. And so we try some of these tools to automate some of those steps. So we're not sitting in front of the computer doing it um, step by step on those processes. Um, and the other thing that I like about Python and um, in ArcGIS, they are completely integrated. So um, what they, I, do I create this interface for the, my scripts that they come up like a tool in ArcGIS? So uh, people are not, um, you know, afraid of using code. If it, if I ask you somebody, hey, I have this script that you have to go there and change a couple lines in the script, uh, you know, people get me a little concerned about it, like, oh, I'm going to mess something up. So what I, I did for my script, it says I created these tools in ArcGIS. Um, for example, you're seeing here um, a flight that we did over some wheat plots. In this uh, area, we have four trials on it. So I create a script where uh, we can calculate uh, around 38 vegetation indices from this imagery and extract the <clears throat> data for every single plot, okay, in each trial. And um, it's going to do in a way that you would just need a few inputs um, here. And I will just show you really quick here how the, the tool works. So. These are uh, the inputs that you need. So you need the shape files for the plots that Diego just created. So we use the, his tools for that. Um, so we have all the four trials here. So we, on this case, I'm using um, a 10 band mosaic. So I know where my 10 band is. I just go find in the folder what it is, select that. Um, I need to go find my trials. So these are the shapes files for each of my trials. And you just select that and hit OK. It's the third one and the fourth one. OK. So that's all basically all the inputs that you, you need for the tool. And now 
uh, <clears throat> if you were to hit, you can hit run here and it's gonna run. Um, it takes, it took around four minutes uh, yesterday to, to run this. Uh, again, it's creating, it's calculating 38 vegetation indices from this 10 band mosaic and is extracting the average data for each plot for each trial and saving that. Um, so if you go, can you see my slides now? Okay, so if we go here, um, Slide show from current slide. What do you see? Okay. Let me flip this. Okay. Uh, you, right. you can you so, can press hide. On so this is what we we had there uh, on Arc. Uh, we have the imagery, all the plots. Uh, Paulo? Paulo? Yeah, you just can press hide. Yes, perfect. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jackie. Uh, so it's running, as I said, it takes four minutes or so to run. Uh, this is what I got yesterday. It ran into four minutes and 43 seconds for all of the data. And from this, what, what do you get? Uh, so it creates a folder for each of the trials, okay? All the trials that we, we have here a folder for each trial. Uh, in each folder, there is uh, <clears throat> a spreadsheet, an Excel file for each of these uh, the statistics that you're seeing here, uh, the mean, the max, the minimum, the range, and the standard deviation. And if you were um, to open that uh, file, you would see something like this. You have the plot IDs that Diego was created from um, Diego's uh, tool. And um, now we will have, we cannot show all of them here, but we have a list of the 38 um, vegetation indices here. And I think on this case, I was displaying the max of um, for each of these vegetation indices for the second trial that you see here on the screen. Um, then again, this, takes, uh, no, four minutes to run. Um, and that's the way that we kind of uh, try to, to create some of these tools to, uh, you know, automate some of the these things. I used to, to do this by hand in ArcGIS, and this kind of work would have taken me hours, if not days, to be completed the drawing the plots and extracting the data, you know, calculate every single vegetation indices by by itself. And, um, you know, it, it has to create a huge savings in time for for our research team. So um, we, we don't have this available yet. Uh, the plan, we're trying to, to get some of this published and then make this available for download or on our uh, website, um, hopefully hopefully soon. So that said, uh, that's all that I, um, I wanna share, Felipe. If anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Yeah, we have a couple of questions from the chat we can go through now. I'll bring this one up first. Someone wanted to know if the drones, you use them to capture data on plant disease. I cannot hear you oh, oh. because I was, my volume was down. Okay. So. <laughs> they wanted to know if uh, you can look at things like disease, severity, growth, and yield parameters. So what are you, what kind of traits are you getting out of your drone data? You, you can, it, it just depends at all. Or what you're trying to do. We're, we're trying to capture some of that data on corn, for example. Um, <clears throat> we're using that 42 megapixel camera. 
uh, I have uh, Dr. Zhao Zheng is kind of leading those efforts. Uh, he has more of a background in machine learning and that kind of stuff. So he, uh, he is helping some of our graduate students to um, analyze some of the data and come up with some um, looking at the level of diseases and then five diseases and the level of severity in corn and wheat. We actually have, I believe, a publication out early this year or late last year on a work that we did in, in the greenhouse on that regard. So it, it is possible, but, um, you know, it's something that, again, you have to, to really know what you're looking for to determine what kind of sensor you're using and what flight conditions do you need to do to carry out your flight to be able to capture the data for the quality to do some of those analysis. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We had someone who wanted a little bit of clarification about plant height and I guess how you're calculating it from your data. Do you mean by plot height here? Yeah. Oh, I think, it, you know, uh, I think on GIS tool, plot height means if you're looking at your plot, you have the width and the height of the plot. Uh, and, you know, you have the size, the height of the plot that you kind of, when you plan it, and here we usually cut like six, three feet in each side off of the plots. And the second plot that where we're extracting the data from, then would be this kind of in, inside plot, or we call the data plot, because we're not pulling the data for the large plot anymore. That way we can deal with the alleys and stuff like that. All right, and the next question we have, can you automatically record the deem time of scans to follow kinetics? I'm not exactly sure what they mean by that. Do you know? I'm not sure what that means. All right. Theo, you know, if you want to clarify in the chat, we can come back to your question. And then we have someone who is wondering if you've ever used the FLIR Duo Pro camera on your drones. Um, so, the floor duo camera is basically that uh, Zen Music Studio camera that we I showed earlier today. Um, what DJI did was integrate that system into a DJI drone into a gimbal, and then they charge you two thousand dollars more for that. Um, I never used the the Pro per se, but I. I have heard a lot of people having issues to stitching that imagery from that camera into Pix4D. And, um, and it seems that the, the issue is how uh, FLIR saves the data on the imagery. I don't have any experience with that. I still have trouble kind of uh, with the XT2 because if you collect data of that and try to bring straight in pix 4D and you look at um, the specs of the camera, like the specs that Diego was talking about, the uh, focal length and things like that, is still pulling the wrong data in. So one of the, <clears throat> the templates that we create in pix 4D uh, kind of uh, is used to correct some of that stuff. I, I totally, I haven't follow up very close, but I don't understand why they haven't figured that out yet. This has been happening for years. Yeah, great. Uh, we do, uh, we previously have another question, Diego already answered, but I guess it's important we just uh, record <laughs> the answer. It is about uh, if it is possible to adjust the segmented plot manually in, in your tool. Diego? Oh, good. I'm myself. <laughs> we yeah. have to be careful because we are close. So, yeah, just uh, recording that answer. Yes, for sure. Uh, I'm. Can you share my screen again? I'll just show real quick. So, so yeah, going back here, you know, once the so. Uh, 
again, you know, here I'm using, there's an R script running in the back of this plugin, but you don't have to know anything about R, you know. You just have to install R in, our, in your computer because you need R in order to run this script. But uh, once the plots are drawn, they become a vector layer inside, uh, inside QGIS, you know. So you could have drawn this manually, it's the same. Like, I can come here to the attribute table and see, you know, all the plot IDs. So it's a vector layer. So let's say your plot is not perfectly aligned in the field. And then, you know, uh, even if you use the, uh, the, even if you input the right size of the plots that should be in the field, they don't align perfectly. Some of them you have to move. Well, this is, you know, uh, if you have some experience with GIS, you're going to come here start editing your uh, your your shape file and then I think I need the advanced digitizing toolbar and for example there are some there is a tool here to move features so let's say I have to adjust some of these features I would no I want to select more of them so I think I have to select them. Yeah, let's say I have to move all these. I'll select them and then I can basically click and move. See, so I can adjust manually one by one if you want or or with a selection of various of them. If for any reason your labels, you know, maybe one or another label is not properly adjusted, you know, if you are editing, you can actually come here and change the label too, or you can export these to Excel, change them, all, all of them automatically, and then uh, put them back here. You know, we are, we don't have time to talk about geoprocessing things here, you know, because, so that's another skill that you, you usually need. With our tools, we are, we, like, the, we try to make everything as easy as possible so that people don't need a lot of experience uh, with GIS and with, uh, pro especially with programming to, to do all these workflow. But, you know, a little bit of uh, geoprocessing, a, a little bit of GIS knowledge is always necessary to work with, you know, with imagery. Uh, it's impossible to go without that. Okay, I think we have time for a few more questions, right, Felipe? Yeah, we have. Yeah, first of all, thank you guys. Thank you so much for sharing these tools with us and uh, with our community. I guess it's really helpful. Sometimes uh, each one of us do do a pipeline in a different way. Sometimes using different softwares. At the end, there are, there are many paths to the glory, right? Uh, we get the same results. But uh, I really, I really like the way that you guys are doing the shape files to me, uh, to find off the structure or the field design that we have, uh, this tool is really awesome to, to help us. Yeah, thank you. All right, so we have three more questions. We'll just try and answer them nice and quick. So the first one is, do you have any ground truth canopy cover validation for the drone data? So I think they're asking, are you comparing it to any ground measurements? For ground data, um, ground canopy cover, I, I, my, the way that I look at to see if, it, you know, to validate the data is I choose uh, my threshold for NDVI, for example, and I go back to my raster of the imagery and check um, is this threshold capturing. Um, the <clears throat> the plant material, uh, the green material, as I was suspecting, you know, is it capturing the canopy of the crop? Um, I never did uh, per se going in a field and try to to do this manually because I don't, you know, it would be really hard to have an accurate number between what you, Philip, see as a ground coverage and what I see is very subjective. Um, I, I trust the computer that can count the pixels and calculate this uh, ratio between the size of my plot and the size of the pixels that I call the, 
the green pixels in that plot. So I think that's a much more accurate number that we're getting there. And the next one was about the Phantom 4 RGB. As the images are not geotagged, how do you georeference those images in your ortho mosaics? From the front of form, the front for Pro has those measure. All the images from the Phantom 4 Pro are geotagged unless you're having some issues of your GPS on the Phantom 4. Um, I'm not aware that they are not geotagged. And, you know, it depends on what you're trying to do. Pix4D sometimes, like, we try to use a Pix4D to stitch images that we collect in the greenhouse. But that is, is a totally different deal. Uh, and they, those images are not geotagged. Uh, but when you're talking about the drones and field the data collection, uh, usually, um, I never, never had a, a process where I didn't have a geotag the images. That's the first step for me. If it doesn't, if it doesn't have a GPS, I just throw it off. It's not. Uh, I think maybe the person was confusing. Maybe the person was a little confused between the geotags and the GCPs that we were talking about. Yeah, so you know, geotags come from the the GPS, the GPS on the drone. So every image that it captures is geotagged. GCPs is another history. Whether you want to use GCPs to have a better accuracy uh, of your ortho mosaic, a better positional accuracy or not, that's you know that's another thing. So you can stitch imagery just with geotags, but you know the positioning in the real world. Let's say if you overlay your ortho mosaic with a satellite imagery that has a very good accuracy, like on Google Earth, Google Maps or anything, uh, it you might see that it doesn't fall exactly uh, on the right place. Whether when you use GCPs, which is an extra thing, then you get, you, you get those coordinates with two centimeter accuracy, and then you, you use those coordinates just to better align your ortho mosaic in the real world, let's say. So if you, you know, plot your ortho mosaic over a satellite imagery, or if you plot several ortho mosaics of the same area with that accuracy, you're gonna see that they fall perfectly on top of each other. So that can be an advantage in some in some some occasions. Okay, yeah, thank you. We do have uh, a couple minutes for uh, one extra question. Yeah, right, this, yeah, this next one actually ties in well to what you were just saying about having multiple pictures of the same plot. They're just asking if you took pictures day after day, if you could look at this, the growth over that time in your plots. That is a good question. You know, if you, if you have a, a, a multi-spectral camera, um, if you're looking at the greenness, then uh, you can compare the images that you take today of tomorrow, of the day after and next week. Now, if you have an RGB camera where you do not have a, a calibration process, because you have to take in account the different light conditions that are outside of today that are going to be outside tomorrow and next week. So on that case, if you don't have a calibration for the RGB camera, you can't compare the greenness, but you can follow uh, the growth. If you're looking, for example, um, ground coverage, you can fly today and calculate ground coverage. You fly tomorrow and calculate next week. And that, that gives us an idea of the growth in the, of your crop in that block. That would be possible. All right, and then I think we can just, I think this person had one more question. Maybe just a little confused about flight paths and stuff because they were saying if you understand well, you can choose a free flight or a circle flight. Um, and they're wondering if you could use those to measure height and do 3D pictures. You can, one of the things that, again, that I like about pix for the capture is that pix for the capture has these uh, different flight mission templates. And one of them is a template for 
a double grid. It's basically, the aircraft flies one path this way and then comes back and fly this way and tilts the camera to capture some of that 3D data. Um, you can definitely use the cloud point that is generating pics for d to calculate point height if you're interested in that. Um, it's a very, you know, that's where uh, ground control points that Jed was talking about and become very important to have some accurate data. And so, um, you know, you might be surprised by this, but uh, the altitude, the, the elevation data in the uh, DJI drones can be off for as far as 100 meters. The, the differences in the field among the plots and stuff like that might, is correct, but when you compare it for the true elevation, it can be way, way off. Um, but, you know, it, it has so many things that you, you have to take in consideration to determine plant height, and that can be a very tricky process. But it is possible, yes. Right, yes. Uh, I guess uh, it's having another uh, uh, questions and conversation in the chat. So please, guys, stay there and keep it talking. And with these, actually, we are close to the end. Uh, we open this space now for you, Paulo, for you, Diego, talk with our community, open your lab for new partnerships to attract students as well, talk about North Dakota State University. So have your time. <laughs> So I just would like to thank you again for the opportunity to meet uh, folks in this group. And please let us know if you, you know, uh, we can collaborate in any ways. There is no one knows everything. And, you know, I'm not an expert in, in uh, programming at all. I do something in Python and I bet you that somebody that has more knowledge than I do can make these things happen. Yeah, in a much more efficient way. Like the scripts that I have, like 1600 lines, I bet you that can be written in probably 500. Um, but, um, you know, if you're interested, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're always looking for partnerships and collaborations. So uh, this is a, um, High throughput phenotype is something that I'm really interested on. And there is a lot of people across NDSU that's very interested and will probably have openings uh, for graduate students uh, in the next uh, semester or future semesters here. Uh, this is just gonna keep it growing and growing. And that is our goal. It's kind of bring some of this uh, plant breeding programs to like a different level that they are now. And uh, the more we can collaborate, the better, the faster we're going to get there. Yeah, uh, Diego? Well, yeah, no. Uh, I I am just a graduate student here, you know, so I am t probably temporarily. Oh, yeah. Uh, I am graduating soon, so I'm looking for a job right now. So if anybody, <laughs> if anybody has anything, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn, my, you know, everything about me. Yeah, and I just want to thank, you know, both of you, Philippe and Claire, you know, thank you for inviting us to present this, uh, this workshop. It's a great experience. Thank, uh, thank you for, you know, allowing us to show our lab here and, show some of the things that we do and show some of the tools that we have created again uh claire just posted again our website you know it's a fresh website we just put it up in the air we're gonna have a lot more not a lot but you know we're gonna uh, be putting more information about us there as as we have and these tools that we create uh there is a link to my tool in that, that website so the 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 QGIS tool is available there, you know, uh, there's a link to GitHub and where you can download it. 
Uh, I saw another question here. So if uh, can vegetation indices from RGB or to mosaics be extracted within QGIS? Yes, you know, my tool just draw the plots. And uh, I don't think we have a tool that calcul automatically that we don't have we don't have the same tool that Paulo showed in ArcGIS. We don't have the same tool. It's something we could do, but otherwise, you know, you can uh, you can use the like for example the raster calculator in QGIS, which is a common GIS tool, and you can calculate your own indices. And I know uh, QGIS also has a tool that can extract info from from polygons you know so once you have the plots that you drew with my tool for example you can extract info inside qgis it's a more manual work as, and uh, than uh, paulo's tool in arcgis that does everything automatically but that works too so again you know thank you guys for the opportunity this was a wonderful time and yeah i'm looking for a job <laughs> <laughs> awesome perfect perfect guys uh, first of all was an amazing presentation very fun uh we could see uh everything that you guys doing and re it's really really great and thank you for coming today and see you soon <laughs> bye bye thank you yeah claire so with these guys uh we are getting at the end of our season from 2020 21 uh, we are open for any suggestion. If you have any tool in your lab and you want to share with our community, please contact us. For example, uh, those guys today, they were sharing a different way to extract information than what we already uh, using drones, right? From uh, different than what we already present before. So if you have a different way to do the, the same analysis again, contact us. We're going to organize our uh, at the next season workshops and also feel free to give suggestions, feedback is the most important tool that we use to keep our community going. Right, Claire? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Anahit is not here today, but she's saying bye and hope to see you, everybody here, the next season again. Maybe, I don't know, this year or next year, we're gonna see according to the demand and according to people showing up and giving uh, some ideas, all right? All right. Everyone have a good field season if you're working out in the field. Keep collecting cool data and we'll we'll see you back when we have a new workshop. All right. Bye bye guys. Bye. See you.